Hello everyone, this is Ranting Politics. Today we are starting Part 3, Section 23. Out in the street, the loudspeakers chanted, Aloy Schmeiser, report if alive. Wu Tu Shi, report if alive. Craig followed Dr. Corey into headquarters. The doctor's great white orb seemed soiled and shriveled. Craig's own body felt altogether depleted. The orderly room babble washed over him. One clerk was saying to another, No, that's the earlier list. This is the later. The other clerk, Are you sure? First clerk, Let me see. A technician shouted, Where's the key to locker 28? The sound detection gear's in there. An overseer, You told me to report if alive. Well, I've been trying to report. A whole hour now I've been trying. So put me down as dead, all right? Technician. There's supposed to be noises in the 9S workings. Who knows where the key is? Dr. Corey. Where's her ladyship? First clerk. In there, sir. He pointed to a door stenciled the commandant. Dr. Corey said to Craig, Wait here, and went in. Two supercilious young guard officers near Craig were conversing in undertones. They ignored the bedraggled slave. The first said, Is Fred in there? The second nodded. The first, Who's with him? Second, Just the whore. The first, I thought I just saw the unit go in. Second, I didn't see him, but if he's in there, so much the better. First, What if Fred peaches? Second, He wouldn't. First, she a beautiful whore, and Fred thinks he's beautiful. Second, Fred's in deeper than we are. First, that's just it. That's why he might sell us. Second, she wouldn't buy, or at least she wouldn't keep her end of the bargain. The whore doesn't like squeed, and Fred should know that. First, I'd be happier if one of us were in there. Second, we weren't invited. Wait till Ulrich and his merry overseers get here. Then we'll all go in. Craig, his fatigue overridden, slouched in a wide circuit through the crowded orderly room, passed an empty desk, picked up an imposing blackbound printout, shuffled to the door marked the commandant, thrust it open, and stepped inside. The lady was leaning over the commandant's desk with a strapping young guard lieutenant, studying a plan of the mines. Dr. Corey sat in a soft armchair, apparently half asleep. Craig shuffled up to the lieutenant. Excuse me, sir, are you Dr. Corey? The lady's eyes narrowed. Dr. Corey's opened. No, idiot, barked the lieutenant. Over there, he shoved Craig roughly toward the doctor, and then wiped off his hands on the skirts of his beautifully pressed tunic. Craig let the push carry him off balance and fell in a whimpering heap at the doctor's feet. The doctor tisked pettishly and bent over Craig. His eyes inquired frantically. Craig whispered between groans, Two pals of this clan waiting outside by the outer door, lieutenants. Some overseers on the way here, all set to get the lady and you. What fool sent you with this? shrilled the doctor, picking up the printout. Don't answer. Shut up! The lady's eyes were on him, puzzled. The doctor studied the printout, but ran his right index finger thoughtfully across his throat. "'Thank you so much, Lieutenant Miscure,' she said loudly. "'I must say, it's a pleasure to see an officer properly dressed around here. I do hope I'll see you tomorrow.' The lieutenant smiled with conscious charm and began to take his leave. "'Oh, one more thing, Lieutenant. But excuse me. Dr. Corey, can you take care of whatever it is you have there while I talk a little more with the lieutenant? Leave the slave here.' Yes, your ladyship. I will be only a minute, said the doctor, and went out the door. The lieutenant looked at Craig, disgusted at his continued presence. The lady. What is your given name, lieutenant? The lieutenant. My friends call me Fred, your ladyship. Dr. Corey reappeared in the doorway, accompanied by the two young officers. The doctor glanced at Craig, who nodded thoughtfully. I thought, said Dr. Corey, these gentlemen might help us with our problem. 
Monsieur and his fellow officers now looked uneasy. Lieutenant Monsieur, said the lady, a little while ago, as I was coming down the hill, Commandant Fentress was in one of the towers, trying to ray a slave out on the hillside. The lieutenant, the slave was thought to be escaping your ladyship. The lady, escaping by running toward the lager, lieutenant? Well, well, let it pass. You, at the time, were on the ground, inside the fence. The lieutenant, yes, your ladyship, I... The lady... And he shouted up to the tower, Jack, on the other side, quick! Or words to that effect. There was an almost imperceptible pause. The lieutenant, I don't remember what I shouted, your ladyship. The lady, I myself heard and saw you. I was coming on the other side. The lieutenant did not answer. Craig moved silently behind one of the other officers. Dr. Corey was already behind the third. The lady, poor Fred, you didn't shout loudly enough. She opened her holster as a girl of an earlier century might have opened her reticule for a handkerchief, drew out a blast pistol, thumbed the aperture wheel, and meticulously obliterated the lieutenant's head. Oh, how smelly, she cried, mock womanishly to the other officers. She looked at Craig. Testify. My lady, he said, if you would cover those two buffoons with your ladyship's blaster while the doctor and I get out of the line of fire. Very good. Thank you, my lady. One of the intrinsic drawbacks of slavery, my lady, is that it denies a fact of life, the humanity of the slave. In the minds of the vulgar, this habitual denial leads to the most impractical aberrations, and those two would-be gentlemen, seeing a slave standing with an earshot large as life, thought nothing of discussing how they and their confederates, some overseers led by a free man they called Ulrich, were going to come in here and deal with two people they referred to. The lady, go on. Craig, did I hear your ladyship order me to go on? The lady, are you afraid? Craig, two people whom they refer to as the whore and the eunuch. The lady, go on. Craig, the late Fred, whose beauty your ladyship has just vandalized, was in deeper than these two. That is, deeper into the squeed trade in this lager. Ulrich will be here shortly. I infer accompanied by what these garrulous freemen refer to as his merry overseers. The lady, well done, slave. Dr. Corey, Dr. Corey, yes, my lady. The lady, how many full doses of those very scientific punishment drugs do you have? The doctor turned with undisguised grief to Craig. Craig smiled and blinked reassuringly. I, I have six doses, your ladyship. The lady sighed. We'll have to make do. That's all. You, sir, she addressed the first officer. What is your name? Are you going to take a slave's word against mine? The lady stared. Why not? Now answer the question, you bad boy, or I shall pull down your pants and burn off your wee-wee with little Bowser here. She wagged the blast pistol. My name is Ralston. The lady, given name? Ralston. Thomas. The lady rummaged in the side pocket of her tunic and produced a slip of paper. There's one thing about this lager. You can't procrastinate here. I was hoping to do this tomorrow. Let's see. This tunic belonged to the late John Fentress, and I found this paper in the pocket. It appears to be a record of money transactions of some sort. FM, that's our late friend here. FM again. VL, FM. J R J A R S U Z Could that be Ulrich? T R That's you. You occur one, two, three times in all. Ralston I've never drunk squeed in my life. The lady You, sir, what's your name? Vasily Leibling. The lady V L You look like small potatoes in this list. A bargain in treason. V.L., would you care to tell me who Ulrich Z. is, who his merry overseers are, and precisely when they are to be expected here? Leibling. No. The lady. Doctor, pick up that mineral on the desk and anesthetize these two patients. Dr. Corey picked up a large, polished slab of carnelian, hefted it, walked behind the two officers, 
and expertly knocked them unconscious. The lady, will they fit in that safe? Good. Take their sidearms. The combination is on the underside of the desk chair. Let's be on our way. Out the back. They ran. The lady holstering her blast pistol. The doctor carrying two others. They tumbled into the ground car. Craig and back. The lady drove it out into the street in a howling swerve. The lady said, The trick is to attack first, I'm told. Which way to the overseer's quarters? Craig. Left. The lady. Doctor, give him one of those guns. Dr. Corey hesitated, eyes closed as if in pain. Yes, your ladyship. He complied. Craig, the two buildings on the right. The lady. We're in time, I think. She slowed the ground car. A knot of men, some carrying laser carbines, others with blast pistols stuck in their belts, others with stun guns, came out of the building and started uphill. Craig, crouching on the floor of the vehicle, called loudly, Ulrich! Ulrich, old man! A burly man in the front of the group looked up inquiringly. Her ladyship put the ground car in screaming acceleration and drove into the midst of the group, lurching over one man's body and sending two others flying brokenly to the side. She pulled the car round in a tight circle and drove at them again. As she looked over her shoulder to check the street behind her, Craig saw that she was smiling, like a child in a swing. Craig fired the blast pistol and brought down Ulrich. The doctor accounted for another. The men were scattering. One ran straight ahead of the car, a featherless biped in terror. The lady followed and ran him down, steering with her left hand as she drew her weapon with her right. She burnt off the feet of three men in one prolonged sweep of fire, and then finished them as they thrashed on the ground. The remnant of the group took cover in their quarters, some in each of the two buildings. Return fire began. Craig said sharply, Drive, my lady. She sent the ground car screeching forward, skidded into a turn, and then took them around the side of the overseer's quarters, up behind the building, around the next one, and back into the street. Craig thought he hit one man aiming from a window. The doctor, his huge figure shielding the girl, was firing coolly and with effect. I have not been to an amusement park since my medical school days, he said. A squad of guards was running down the hill toward them. The girl swung the ground car toward them, slowing. Craig, be careful, my lady. They may belong to the other side. The lady, we'll know soon enough. She brought the vehicle to a halt, alighted, and walked toward them, a straight, fragile figure in the waning sun. A shot from down the hill went wide. She ignored it. The guards watched her approach. Who's in command? she asked. A corporal stepped forward and saluted. She returned the salute by touching the snout of her blast pistol to her fair hair. The lady. There are some mutinous overseers in those two buildings. I should say about six are still alive. Take your squad and surround the buildings. Overseers are never issued radiation weapons, I take it. I thought not. Execute any man in those buildings who has a weapon. No prisoners, please. Follow me. The corporal saluted. Squad, skirmish order. At the double. The fight was brief. The corporal's squad, two fewer in number, stacked the bodies in the street and, at the lady's command, fell in. She stood before them, the embers of the fight still alive in her eyes, and began, Men, you have my... The low slanting rays of the sun threw a shadow that was somehow wrong in the corner of Craig's field of vision, and it moved slightly. He bellowed, Over there! Get him! Plunged at the lady, and knocked her down with his body, covering her. From behind and to the left of him, where the man with a weapon lurked, came the first rattle of ionization. All right, that was chapter 23. These run-on sentences are killing me. Um, we are on to section 24. Under his back was a softness like, like the preposterous past. He opened an eye. Above him loomed and wavered the face of Dr. Corey. Dizzy? the doctor asked. Very. Then close that bloodshot eye, Craig obeyed. That crete note there only had a stunner. The doctor's high voice went on. But it could have shorted out her ladyship's brain. Or yours. I do not think you got a very heavy dose, though. 
her ladyship. Quite unharmed. You are not terribly heavy. Craig tried with one eye again and then opened the other. The dizziness subsided. Dr. Corey? She is across the street at headquarters, settling a few matters, but she will be here shortly. You are to wait. Craig? Where is here? Dr. Corey? These are the commandant's quarters, and this is the late John Fentress's own room. Craig? Is this bed a particularly soft one? The doctor smiled. Only by contrast. The door opened and her ladyship strode in, alone. She still wore the holster belt over the scarlet tunic. Her face, still smudged, was now in repose. She jammed her hands into the side pockets of the tunic and swung around the room. So this was the fellow's boudoir, she said softly. Not a nice man. Dr. Corey? A squeed room. The lady? No wonder he wouldn't show it to us when we came yesterday. Distinctly a squeed room. There was an unhealthy brilliance to the colors, and something else. Dr. Corey? Before the sorting out, the erection of Narcissus, the lady went to the night table and twitched open the drawer. Yes. She took out a small carved bottle capped with a tiny golden chalice. Here, she held the bottle out to the doctor. Her eyes were hard. Is that a toilet in there? Get rid of this. Every molecule. Can you use my blast pistol on the bottle without setting the place on fire? Dr. Corey? I think so. He took the bottle and the weapon and disappeared. Craig started struggling to his feet. The lady said sharply, Stay there. Craig, may I know what your ladyship intends to do with me? She ignored the question. The doctor returned and held out the weapon to her. She dropped it into the holster. Dr. Corey, with your permission, I shall go over to headquarters and see whether my influence extends to some kitchen somewhere. Will your ladyship join me? The lady, as you know, I like the salt of hunger. Dr. Corey, until whenever then. He bowed and rolled out. Her ladyship locked the door. Craig, may I not know what your ladyship intends to do with me? She looked down at him with eyes the color of smoke, slid the harness off her tunic and the tunic off her arms, letting the gear fall to the floor, and stood, scratched muddy and glowing through the rents in her thin black suit. Then she suddenly clapped her hands and laughed happily. I just realized, she said, I forgot all about those lieutenants in the safe, and there can't be much air left in there. Well, never mind them. It'll save trouble. She was poised above him. Her face took on a fiercer amusement. The pale gold hair cascaded over it. Her whisper fell on his skin. As to your insolent question, slave, the answer is four things. All right, and that was section 24. We are on to section 25. I could make you the commandant of this place if I wanted to, she said languidly and stretched. But I'm not finished with you yet. You know, you're wrong about slavery. It doesn't deny the humanity of the slave. If you weren't human, you wouldn't be a slave, and I wouldn't be a slave owner. If I weren't so tired, I'd send you over to the orderly room to fetch me my cat. Her body in repose retained a heartbreaking grace. What was your name? she asked. John Smith. What was your real name? A long pause. John Smith. She laughed. I shall let you have your little mystery. And because you're now going to be, as we say, attached to my person, because it really wouldn't do, you know, to have you running about the mines and talking around after you've killed free men and taken liberties with your mistress, I shall give you the name, um, Smitty. Are my feet beautiful, Smitty? Very beautiful. Very talented. Do you respect my feet, Smitty? I respect them, my lady. Do you respect every part of me, Smitty? I do, my lady. You'd better. I think I'll get up and look for Dr. Corey. I don't suppose we could find any of your food at this hour, so you can have some of ours. 
and I can't let you go to the slave barracks, for reasons noted above. I shall sleep in my other room tonight, and you can sleep across the foot of my bed, in case I need anything. All right, and that was section 25. We're finally getting into the erotica portion of this very weird novel. Um, oh, God, sci-fi is so ridiculous. This, this is as bad as anime right now, but I tell you what, we're going to go on to section 26. Craig, locked for the morning in the commandant's bedroom, lay on the bed, alternately sleeping and composing a sonnet. For reasons he did not understand at first, his imagination had been drawn back to the instant in the dusty warehouse when, on his knees before Bastigliano, he saw the incision he had made. This bright arterial blood was on its way, to drive an act of violence. This blue vein was the cloaca, since what could remain of any act but molecules? This gray integument was bared to feel the play of terror-quickened breath. This chain of neurons, firing to the distant brain, has something very different now to say. This thumb survived the forest, where an ape could grasp a stick or stone of such a shape as to trepan a foe or feed a wife. This ego, twisting at the thought of rape, whispered its order, and this little knife was large enough to take a roaring life. And what makes the lady different? Craig asked the ceiling, suddenly understanding himself. Beauty? The thought came to him. The fat doctor, who must know a great deal about slaves, had said, he may lose sight of the difference. And he, Craig, had answered in Lavater's words, nothing is so pregnant as cruelty. Around midday, the door was unlocked and Dr. Corey rolled in, immaculate and firmly spherical in a fresh white suit. The skimmer has been ordered for an hour from now, he said happily. Do you have any possessions? One or two. In barrack cell. I shall come with you to fetch them. The central street was drying and there was less visible disorder. Neat stacks of green bags lay quietly on corners. The loudspeakers were silent. The doctor followed Craig into the barracks. Someone, he said critically from behind Craig's shoulder, has bitten through the nice new skin I put on that last night. Craig grunted. His eyes were questing in the dim chamber. He saw a slave lying inert on a pallet at the far end and said in a low voice, Doctor, is that man dead? The doctor glanced across the room and looked at Craig. I will go see, he said with the trace of a smile. With Dr. Corey several meters away, Craig bent swiftly and, picking up with his left hand the little gray wash bag containing the skin cloth, the cake of vermin-killing soap, and the can of face depilatory he had been issued, with his right felt under the edge of his palate for the knife, its blade forced into a crack in the palate frame. He found it, closed it, and was slipping it into the pocket of his trousers when Dr. Corey's podgy hand closed over his. Craig stood up. The doctor silently held out his hand. Craig placed the knife in it, suddenly hoping the fat man would keep it. The doctor opened the knife, thumbed the blade, and inspected it, remarking, The slave you were concerned about is alive, suffering from exhaustion. That is all. I have told his fellows that they must make him go to the meals. He handed the knife back to Craig and said, You will be tempted, but I think you are very strong. He ignored Craig's questioning look. All right, that was section 26. Now we are into section 27. The skimmer, Craig recognized it as an old PC-14 and supposed that if he scratched the paint, he would find the insignia of one of the Tehran armed forces, took them high over the great blackish green fen of Blind Marsh, dappled at the end of the rainy season with shiny patches and tufts of mist, white in the milky sunlight. Across the fen, the nearly straight line of the Ore Railroad ran toward the sea. The sea itself was a silver edge on the world far to the left. Behind them and to their right rose the hills, between the crests of which Craig glimpsed the swollen river, the Mulbrack, Dr. Corey called it. Craig was sitting alone at the rear of the cabin. They were almost over the castle before he saw it, a sheaf of towers, looking from the descending skimmer like a pipe organ in reduced circumstances on a high, 
foam-bordered promontory nosing into a dark green bay. All right, that was section 27, and I think that might be it for today. It looks like we did part three, section 23 through 27. This was a very challenging read once again. Um, it seems that these sections are getting a lot shorter, and I am a little confused where the story is going. But, you know, I guess we'll have to see. Um, I'm a little confused, like what, I don't know, this is just a very, very weird story. And I'm just going to have to live with that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you guys are on this journey with me. This is very, uh, I'm glad I get to share this with somebody. Um, but yeah, that should be it. Next week, we will be starting with part three, section 28, and going until I'm ready to sc stop again. So um, that should be it. This is Ranting Politics, and I hope you have a nice day. Bye-bye.